Well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk. Um, today I want to talk uh, about DevOps, which I'm sure most of you, all of you know what it is, but um, for artworks. So I want to begin with stating some facts, and the easier ones are that I believe that hackers are artists and artists are hackers. Um, Maybe not everyone feels like an artist who is a hacker, and surely not every artist feels um, the same way, but hacking is a creative process. Um, therefore, all hackers are also artists. Um, both of them, hackers and artists, use um, technology in a creative way. Uh, I always, always try to explain what a hacker does by saying that a hacker can make coffee with a toaster. Um, Hackers and artists both challenge the status quo, so they're not happy with what exists. They want to discover new things, they want to open up technology, uh, discover new worlds, whatever you can imagine. Um, and hackers and artists both look at things in a different way uh, than most of the other people do. So <clears throat> some people see just a broken website, other people see their next Congress talk and some exploits that they can find. Um, artists see broken things, they see art. So there um, are quite some similarities. And I believe that um, this is also the reason why in the hacker ethics, that is one of the pillars of CCC, um, uh, you can create art and beauty on a computer as part of it. Um, this is a really important statement, I think, uh, because it shows, and it, it was published in um, 1984, that computers are more than just calculating machines, um, are more than just uh, tools. Um, computers can be uh, helpful for creating things, and this is, I think, a basic understanding that we should have for this talk. Um, so I would like to start by asking the audience, so we'll try to do a little bit interactive, who was in the museum in the past six months? Okay, I'm impressed. I had crowds where like less people got their hands up. Um, who was more than once in the museum in the last six months. Okay, good, I see why you're all here. <laughs> Very happy uh, that you found the right way. Uh, so, um, I have some images in the talk. This is more like, uh, to give an example, um, and uh, the question is, how could it look if you can create art and beauty? Well, um, this would be one example. Um, maybe you know it, Refik Anadol, uh, Machine Hallucinations, this was shown in Berlin. So. This is the proof maybe we can create art and beauty on a computer. But um, creating art and beauty is one thing, and this is maybe what we want to talk about, is can you also show art and beauty on a computer? Um, I think the answer is yes, but, and this is what I want to talk about now, because it's not that easy. Um, we can create art with computers, but um, as you all know, Computers are weird, computers are complicated, they break, they do whatever they want to do, um, and uh, th therefore there, there is a problem that arises. Um, there are a lot of media art and art um, re technology-related art uh, parts and artworks. I want to talk more about software and computers and art, um, so, but it also could be applied to video art, sound art, and. Uh, media art in general. Um, the fast-paced development in technology and the extreme short self, uh, shelf life of components um, is, is truly a, a challenge because you want to rely on them, you need them uh, to present art, uh, so therefore you need to find a way to mingle with them. Um, so that you all understand my motivation right, I like art and computers. I think both go hand in hand, as we have already said. Um, I also realize that artists talk more about tech than um, hackers talk about art. So maybe that's the question I would like to ask, because I want to talk more about art with hackers, since we are all artists and all hackers are artists and vice versa. So uh, both artists and hackers use the same tool set. Uh, we use software, we use computers, we use hardwares, and uh, hackers and engineers have solutions for breaking computers, for breaking software, for maintenance, and so on and so forth. Uh, 
these kind of problem solving is not uh, has not fully arrived yet in the art world, and um, I would like to talk more about that because I think that solutions that you find for enterprise software and the maintenance of any kind of apps can be something that uh, is also useful in the art world. Um, the, I'm going to explain uh, three concepts related to artworks, um, which is presentation, conservation, and restoration. Uh, and this will be important for later. None, none of them involves the artist itself, so we only talk about the artwork. Um, explain me like I'm five, so maybe you know the Reddit uh, subreddit about that. Um, what is conservation? Conservation focuses on the preservation of the original artwork. Um, we uh, we want to keep it the way it is, right? So no changes are made to the artwork. You can do things around it. You can maybe uh, uh, it has to stay the way it is, right? So the first question that comes is, what does that actually mean? So what what is the artwork? Um, maybe to give an example, a very simple one for a painting, it would be more about that. Uh, we, you replace the varnish, you control the temperature and humidity to prevent any kind of degradation of the artwork. That is quite straightforward. But um, let's say you have a, an app, a website. How do you conserve it? Do you just hope that uh, um, the Internet Archive scrapes it and then you're done with it? Or do you save it on a floppy drive on a USB stick? And this is, or what? What is the artwork itself? Is it just the website? Is it the computer with the entire website? So that's already the the, the first questions that we um, uh, we have. And then, what is most important? Uh, software usually interacts with someone. So software itself is quite um, useless. It's only useful if someone uses it. Uh, so actually, the interaction with it, the environment of software, also has a heavy influence on how you handle it. One option could be that you could just buy old computers and have a huge storage of computers, which is what people do, but that uh, doesn't always work and doesn't always work for the future. Um, so we need some different strategies. So that's about conservation. Um, how does it look? It's a bit of an example. This is uh, the artwork bubbles, and um, maybe you see it on the left side of the screen. Um, it has a Power Mac G4, which is quite an old computer, uh, an old video camera, MIDI controller, synthesizer, and speakers, and it is the original um, G4 Mac. So you handle it with care, you make sure that it still works, um, uh, and these kind of things. So this would be an example of artwork conservation. Then we have the presentation. So art to be enjoyed has to be presented. Um, one very important part that I think sometimes is underrated is uh, explaining the right context of art. If you look at um, 3D generated art or any kind of software art, you could easily say, well, that's boring. I see that every day on my screen. Um, but when you look at the explanation, you see, well, this was something that was made 30 years ago when these kind of technologies were absolutely not um, widespread and uh, the use for artists also was not at all um, uh, clear for everyone. So the presentation form is quite important. Um, imagine you have a software from the 90s. You could present it on like a brand new laptop, which would still work, but would also be a little bit weird because it was developed on a very old computer. So you could say, you have to present it on an old computer, on an old screen, CRT screens, whatever. So this is, this is part of the artwork itself, because it has some kind of um, appearance, it has some kind of influence on you as a, as a viewer, um, and the, the tech that drives it is part of it. To give another example, if you have a painting that is um, in a museum on a wall, you look at the painting, but you are influenced by the space itself. It's maybe uh, the light is dimmed, the temperature is cooler, or uh, the, 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 it's a wide cube, it's a big room, a small room, there are many people, very few people inside. So these are all things that also influenced your experience of uh, the artwork, and same goes for software. So if it's a fast, old computer, high resolution, low resolution, this is all part of it. Mm, and the last uh, aspect of presentation is give access without risk of wear and tear. 
For paintings, it's uh, uh, very simple. You dim the light, you control the climate, you put a glass projection in front so that no one puts tomato soup on it. Uh, for software, well, it's more, especially if you have old computers or old hardware, you would make sure that it, for example, doesn't run 24-7. Um, if you have interactive parts like uh, controllers or buttons, you make sure that these are very reliable or you change them uh, to use newer parts so that visitors will try whatever they do with it. They will press on it, jump on it. Uh, so it has, to be, it has to have some kind of resistance. Um, an example, for example, is the work uh, Your Code from Peter Weibel and Ben Littermann. Um, nothing much is here. It is presented. It is well organized. Uh, it is in a set-up space with the lights. Uh, so, yeah, nothing special to see here. The last part, uh, restoration, is, um, I would say, <laughs> the most difficult part because that's when maybe your conservation has failed um, and the artwork is not in its desired state anymore. For example, a screen is broken um, and you cannot replace it. Um, or the software is unavailable, you don't have the source code anymore. The compiled source code doesn't work, you cannot, you cannot use it anymore. So then the strategy is to get as close as possible to the initial appearance of function, um, either by reproduction. So for example, you could replace the screen. Um, you could replace something else, a button or a computer, or in the worst case, reinterpretation, where you take the idea, the initial intent of the artist, and you build a new artwork from scratch that looks and feels very similar to the old one, but technically is not the same as the old one. Um, so to, give an, to keep with the example with a painting, for a painting to be that there is missing paint on the canvas because it has fallen apart or during handling it was damaged. So you would, with a new material, apply paint again, so then it would look very close to the original painting. For software, you can write it from scratch. One example is um, from Michael Bilicki, Columbus 2. This was a software that initially was written in uh, Java and then didn't run anymore, and anybody wanted more features, higher resolution, so it was completely um, rewritten from scratch, um, but looks and feels like the initial artwork. This can be also a very, uh, um, very important strategy if for some reason something else breaks that you don't have control over but that you need for your artwork. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So we talked about restoration, conservation, and um, presentation. And now I want to put these a little bit in, in relationship to what it means if you create art on a computer. Art on a computer relies on a computer. I said in the beginning, you, you all, you're all here because computers are not e maybe easy to use. I mean, if they would be easy to use and just do whatever we want to do, I don't know if there would be like such an event. Uh, so one thing that is part of it is the software, and the software is the hardware, and then there's data and information. So the thing is that most of these things are, when you look at the computer, out of your own control. Software, you have to buy it. Software can get de deprecated. It can require hardware licenses and so on and so forth. Hardware can break down, and in the worst case, it goes out of production um, and cannot be bought anymore. But I think the, the, these two points are quite uh, obvious. I mean, who doesn't know the issue with you have, I don't know, old um, videos and uh, you don't find the right software or edited project files and you, the software doesn't exist anymore, your old laptop is broken and you've lost access to it. Or you have done a lot of things in an expensive software which gets even more expensive and you don't have the funds anymore to buy it, then you lost, lose access. This is quite um, obvious. But um, in the past years, and in my work, I found a very important part, and that is the data and information part. Because uh, suddenly we had artists, or I've seen artists building on top of the Twitter API, on top of Facebook APIs, uh, on top of many fun services that suddenly went bankrupt, or closed, or changed their um, way of working. And uh, suddenly the whole artwork was broken even though Twitter was still there or Facebook was still there, and the data even was still there, but not any more um, reachable for the artworks. Um, the other part that is quite important is that uh, the artwork, if you have produced it, it exists and it stays there, but the environment 
for example, the legal environment around it changes. So we have seen the introduction of more um, uh, detailed and also um, more complex data privacy laws uh, in Germany with uh, DSGVO, but also in general, um, uh, a lot of laws around uh, the topic of data, data processing are published. And if you have an artwork that actually suddenly does something that is illegal because it was part of the initial idea 20 years ago when less people talked about privacy, you have to show it in a different way. And maybe you cannot even show it anymore in the original way because suddenly it's way of operating becomes illegal. The other part that uh, for art and beauty created on the computer is that it actually relies on a human. Uh, it relies on a human operator which has to use the computer and without him using or taking a look at it, it's, it doesn't really exist, right? Um, because many of the works, not all of them, but many are based on interaction. And if there is no interaction, the work is not complete. Um, which is also quite a, a, an important fact to maybe um, keep in mind. So we talked about the, the, three, uh, uh, the three parts, presentation, uh, conservation, and restoration, and I want to present some strategies uh, just as an inspiration also for all of you. So the one uh, strategy for presentation is actually um, hack consumer hardware. What do I mean by that is that if you think about augmented reality and virtual reality, artists and museums mostly buy hardware from off-the-shelf components. They go to Media Markt or Saturn or wherever, buy it online, and they buy VR glasses. But those VR glasses are built and designed for operations at home. That means that maybe per day you use it two or three hours, and it's mostly one or two different people that use it. If you put it in a public space where many people suddenly use it, right? You, you will have 50 people that use it at the same time. They all have different uh, face configurations. This needs to be adjusted. You need to explain it. Um, this is all not, not well thought through for these kind of devices. Because if you have a VR headset, you buy it and you have two or three hours at home to get used to it. Yeah, you set it up, you play with it around, and then you start doing the fancy stuff. If you go into a museum, you set it up, and then you have five seconds to get used to it. You cannot stand for two hours there and just enjoy the tech and getting to use it. And it's not very much designed for it. Um, this is kind of a, a problem. Or, for example, I've not directly, but heard of that some of the, um, uh, the, the head-mounted devices crash after a certain amount of time because normally you would operate them battery-powered. And uh, suddenly in the museum they had a cable for power supply and they would run for, run for much longer times. That was never intended by, by the software engineer, so weird things happen. Um, and the other point uh, that, that is a huge problem is uh, digital rights management. Um, because suddenly, if we go back to the example of uh, VR, um, you cannot use them without an account anymore. You have to create an account, it has to be a special account, sometimes you even have to, for some services, provide a credit card, um, which, which is one thing, but on the other side, in the menu, you, for example, cannot uh, pr um, forbid the buying of, of like uh, packages in some internal stores, and I mean, there's not always someone standing from a guard or some staff from the museum next to the um, virtual reality glass. So you could have the situation where some visitor puts on the glass and is like, oh, I can buy these apps or I can do that fancy stuff, and suddenly the museum's credit cards get charged. Um, I didn't hear that happen, but uh, I know that it took a lot of work in the preparation to check all these kind of things um, and, and be sure that you cannot break it. Um, also, for example, if you s to keep with the example because it's quite clear, uh, usually you enjoy your experience in virtual reality, augmented reality, any kind of interactive experience, and then <clears throat> you just leave and go see another artwork, but suddenly someone else will come after it and he will find the, the software in a very weird state. Usually it, is, it has a bug or it has crashed and that's why someone left and didn't say anything. So this kind of handling of the frequent change of a viewer and, 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 and the public spaces is quite difficult. So you try to find solutions by actually hacking the artwork itself uh, to present it. 
by uh, I've seen all kind of things, servo, servo motors uh, pressing on buttons, um, using kiosk mode uh, to prevent kind of right click and people printing stuff from the artwork, or people reading their emails. It's very weird. I've seen people like open Gmail on artworks and read their own email like in the museum. Um, <laughs> Because people, they, they, they don't care. They're, they're like, oh, it's a computer. I've also seen, and I'm less happy about the hackers who wanted to prove that they're hacker, hackers by installing Windows XP on some old phone booth. And I was like, yeah, that's nice, but actually no one can enjoy it anymore. And I, I don't know if there is so much pride in that you can install Windows XP as a hacker. <laughs> and um, uh, how does it look? I mean, uh, in terms of relying on uh, uh, public uh, available hardware, that is, for example, the Kinect from Microsoft, uh, Kinect V2, um, which is a, a super camera because you can use it for many things and it gives you a lot of data, but unfortunately it has gone out of production because um, I believe Microsoft doesn't feel the need to build it anymore because they don't sell it anymore, but suddenly Let's imagine you're an artist, you, all your works build on it. Suddenly all the libraries stop working, um, you cannot buy any spare parts. And uh, uh, this, this then becomes quite a, a problem also for the presentation. Um, to give an example with these kind of cameras, they have, if we had to build in different power supplies because the, 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 the ones that you get shipped with work with the Xbox. It's super weird, you start getting weird issues where they crash for no reason. Um, so yeah, this is kind of uh, the challenging part. Um, maybe also less uh, less uh, exciting, but also important strategies of conservation. So obviously you can archive the software with all, of, all its dependencies. That's quite easy. You just export it um, as source code. You put it somewhere and then it's there. Um, but again, the problem is if you pull it out of storage, you are confronted with situations like different legal requirements, different hardware requirements, different realities that um, that uh, that you cannot foresee. So, just archiving the software and just having a backup of it is actually not uh, not enough. You. Um, build a storage of all devices. I don't know yeah, what I meant with that, but mostly I think that actually uh, to cope with the idea of um, uh, uh, requiring old tech is to just buy a lot of old tech. So um, you will see for different shows, museum and curators going on, uh, on, on Craigslist, on eBay, on wherever, and buying all the CRT screens they find or all the blue keyboards they find. Um, they will be buying 120 printers in batch because then they don't need to worry about printers anymore. So very weird things happen, but um, obviously you know, also need to train staff to maintain those devices um, or start the production of new old devices, which is something that um, can be very interesting. If, for example, you say uh, the, we, need, we have artworks that use a needle printer and, well, I can build one. And then suddenly you start selling needle printers to artists that want to use the old tech. So um, kind of fun things happen there. Strategies of restoration, I've already said a little bit. Well, one of it is reverse engineering. And uh, reverse engineering is one big problem because actually uh, it becomes more and more difficult over time. Uh, software gets more complex, devices get more complex, uh, everything is a black box, um, APIs are black boxes, and you can actually, uh, you, you can maybe restore the core artwork, but everything else around it is um, super weird, and you have no idea how it works, and therefore you cannot restore it. Um, you can also rewrite and rebuild it from scratch, which I think is, uh, uh, it's sometimes it feels like the easy way, but uh, it also feels like letting go of something because you say, well, the old thing dies and I want to do the new one. Obviously, you can start emulating hardware, um, so a lot of simulators of uh, old Apple machines or old computers to run, I don't know, Windows 95 or Mac OS 9 on it, so you get the software running. That is one uh, strategy. Or obviously build mock-up interfaces, so if the some API is gone, you just build a web service that delivers the kind of same uh, data. Okay. Well, there is actually, you all know it, and it's in the title of the talk, there's something that is called DevOps that, in my opinion, is something that you you can use to challenge all these kind of problems, right? If, if your hardware changes, if the software changes, if the requirement changes, you go into this kind of loop and you look at everything and 
and and everything is happy, everyone is happy, and 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 there is no drama. Um, but usually that only works because all this kind of process is done by one team, hopefully in one location on one product, and everybody understands all the part of the steps. Uh, if we take that and look at it um, from the artwork uh, parts, and I got a very good suggestion that this would be the arts art ops life cycle. I put life cycle in, in quotes because um, you will see what I mean. Is obviously you start by a plan, which would be your idea. Then you write the software and you build it. Um, congratulations, you're an artist. And what an artist does is actually he does an artwork, which can be released then. So now we have already the first step. The artist has an idea, codes it, builds it, releases it. And that's when it gets more interesting. So you want to deploy and operate it and obviously monitor and test it. What does monitor and test mean for an artwork? I don't know, monitor probably that visitors will complain that it's broken. And uh, test is just you sit next to it and watch how people react. But that's, that's already when it becomes a bit undefined. Um, the part deploy and operate is something that is done by the museum mostly. Monitor and testing, it depends. Some, some do it, others don't do it. Uh, there is no clear rule for that. And then you could say, well, perfect. If like the museum has an issue, it monitors, tests it, and then we can plan and build and release again. Uh, the problem is that's not how it works. Usually you will have very weird um, loops. So the museums try to operate the artwork because it's not their artwork, so they cannot like start making changes to it. So they have to do maintenance, but they cannot uh, influence the artwork. So they will try to change everything around it. Uh, sometimes museums give feedbacks to artists. I don't know if all of them do. Maybe you have artists that work in the museum because they're guest artists or resident artists, um, these kind of things. But that's not also the rule. Uh, then you also have we said the conservation part, which is also mainly, mainly deploy, operate, monitor, and test, because you would take it out of your storage, look if it still works, check if it's broken, and if, yeah, then you fix it, but you don't change it anymore. And the problem with this is that actually most of the time, uh, on the right side of the graph, you can, it moves very fast in many loops. Um, if something breaks in the museum, staff will come and fix it, switch it off, switch it on, read the documentation. But the bigger problem is that actually, rarely you move backwards to the artwork, because the artwork is something um, that is there and that exists. Yeah? So these are the thoughts and issues about that, is that you surely know the term, is that, sorry. <coughs> Artworks often are seen as immutable objects. Right? This is something the artist has produced. It has this creative process. Ta-da, artwork's there. And then others look at it. But you don't change it anymore. Because the artist has done it with a certain intent, and that's part of this artwork. It's a finished part of it, right? Then you have the exhibition, which is an immutable collection of immutable objects, because you have a curator which designs the exhibition, he selects the work, he carefully puts them in a certain arrangement, he writes descriptions, there's a topic, um, there is a red, uh, how you say, um, you, you go through the exhibition and you, you, there's a story and these kind of things. And if you would change the function of an artwork, it will probably also break with the curated exhibition. So that's a problem and that's a bit of a conflict with the expectation of reliable operation deployment. Because it, um, it, in some artists do do a lot of testing and their works f work pretty well and reliably. And then you have zero issues, but that's not all of them. Um, especially when you take artworks, you put them into different museums, and suddenly the environments are completely different. You will have slow internet, fast internet. Uh, sometimes the computer will be in in some box with no ventilation or. It will be placed 20 meters away from the screen, but HDMI can only cope with 15 meters. So you get like these kind of weird issues that nobody has ever planned for. And then the moment you want to set it up, uh, you cannot change it anymore. And so a lot of uh, 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 problem solving goes into attempting to control the environment. Into I've seen people trying to buy more expensive HDMI cables because maybe then 20 meters works, or sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. 
or um, you buy different data sims because it's faster than the network connectivity of the museum. All of these are near impossible attempts to control something that's actually not in your um, scope of, of what you could control. Um, the other issues come to the artwork itself is that, as said, artists are also hackers, and the problem is that they will buy hardware and be like, oh, that's fun, I can hack it and make an artwork out of it, which means that you actually need to maintain hacks and hack even more hacks to maintain the hacks that have been hacked previously. Um, so, yeah, there, 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 is no, like, there is no manual for it. If you uh, are lucky, the artist wrote a manual on how he hacked the stuff so you can continue hacking it. Um, but mostly you don't know. Stuff is more and more complex uh, and uh, more and more interconnected and this also becomes um, a problem because suddenly you have unforeseen consequences. So uh, just to give an example, we had a work that was, um, there was a web-based artwork which was super nice and, and uh, you could um, interact with it and with other people and so on and so forth and uh, suddenly uh, while checking it before showing it, we found out that obviously for the multiplayer, because it interacts with other people, it uses a service based in the US because someone has included it in some sub-unity package and building it. The artist was not aware that the work um, was actually transmitting personal data uh, to servers uh, abroad. And suddenly we had to slash the whole thing and tell him, like, by the way, you need to fix this because we cannot show it. And the artist was like, yeah, but I'm just an artist. I have no idea how to fix it. And you, 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 there, there, there's a little sadness because you have, you have prepared something and you're super happy to show it. And suddenly there's like some guy who comes and is like, no, it's not data privacy compliant. Go fix it. So th there's a lot of friction um, there. And that is also because you, you use tech that you... Uh, well, you don't understand the other issues. For example, we had uh, uh, artists using... Uh, a USB camera, which had USB-C, but for some reason his software only used the USB 2 mode. And so, uh, this is maybe too far from my knowledge, but as far as I know, USB-C cables, if you use it in legacy mode, have actually direction. So you can, they, they, they behave differently the way you plug it. Um, and uh, the person didn't understand what why a USB-C cable would work differently if you plugged it in another way around because you used the weird driver mode. and So it gets more and more complex and then you start seeing little dots and pictures and it's like, you have to plug it this way around. And there's then some unrelated technician who's like, that's stupid because USB-C goes in both directions and then they fight. So there, <laughs> there are a lot of things that, that, that happen there. Um, so, well, uh, there are some strategies about how you could go on with it. Um, short and midterm ones, we we'll start with that, and that is actually there's something that is already happening, is involve artists in restoration and conservation processes. This can be artists, but actually I should have written artists and hackers. Um, this means that if you, as an artist, build an artwork and it gets collected, they will contact you immediately and ask you documentation, and not only when it's broken, right? So. And you put it in contracts, you make agreements, that you do maintenance, that when you buy an artwork, you start planning money for uh, uh, making it work like So there's a, a, lot, a lot of planning process to already mitigate like the more basic issues. Mm. The other um, part, and that's where I think most of us hackers also come in, in action, is to, um, oh sorry, yeah, to gain control over hardware and software development. Because we, if, if, I mean, if you don't want to buy a software, you can just write it yourself, right? If, uh, um, if you want different hardware, you can just build it yourself. And actually museums and, 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 and collections and artists can also do that. Um, so there are a lot of projects that um, are, uh, have the goal to develop hardware um, that is, has no vendor lock-in, that is free from any kind of DRM. Um, the one motivation can be that you don't have to buy it, you can just use it, but the other motivation is that you prevent these kind of issues that um, a museum would have into uh, showing it or having to buy licenses. Um, and build alter, um, alternatives um, and mocks to escape the vendor lock-in. And this is, I think, uh, this is quite a, uh, an important part because that's where hackers and artists can get very, can, can, can get very close to each other and work together on many things. Um, because they're, they're, they use the same tool, right? 
if uh, any kind of software that is developed um, sometimes for scientific purposes is then used by artists. And so you, you, there are many co collaborations and cooperations that can be done. Um, and especially also, I think, uh, museums and art institutions can um, be part of that. They have uh, artists in residencies. Museums can actually hire software engineers and um, drive that development. Long-term strategies uh, actually is a lot of discussions and decisions. Because one part would be to talk about the ex expected shelf life of artworks. Um, if you were lived 40,000 years ago and you were painting things on some cave, so some caveman, uh, you didn't care about it and your artwork is still there and that's fine, you can say I, I build it for future generations. But if you build some uh, um, app that runs on your iPhone, then you can, it will be difficult to expect that it runs for the next thousand years. Uh, so maybe one solution of that is to say, well, if I produce an artwork that requires a certain technical environment, I um, want it to live as long as that environment lives. Um, why would it be something would it be maybe weird if you have uh, something that uses an API of a social media network and the moment the social media network dies, you try to emulate and copy it, but maybe 20 years later, who will understand what MySpace is, right? You would say, I build a fancy MySpace artwork. But instead of explaining the artwork, you first need to explain what MySpace was. Um, so that, that is something that uh, um, artists have to individually decide uh, what they want. And there are many ranges from artists who say, that's not, uh, I don't care. Someone else has to figure that out. Other artists say, um, my artwork is not an immutable artwork. As long as my intent uh, exists, I'm happy as long as it runs. It can be a 50-inch screen, 75-inch screen, can be black and white color, I don't care. As long as my idea is there, um, it's, uh, it's, still, uh, it's still valid. Um, the other part is education and training, and that's something that, uh, that I realized often, is that a good idea would be to make software and hardware engineering part of the artistic curriculum. So that you have, and I think some, some art universities already do it, uh, that you have um, software engineering classes, that you get an understanding of how software engineering works, how these processes are, and especially what the challenges are for software engineers, so that you can properly talk to them and not that it gets some weird misunderstanding at the end. The same way, uh, any other way around, is that um, I think it would benefit a lot of engineers to get actually more art as part of their scientific and engineering curriculum. Um, when I was in school, I think art, I mean, it was nice, but it was the first thing that I dropped. And I realized that my personal art education has stopped very early. And later on, I got confronted with artists, and I thought, oh, that's all stupid. Uh, but it turns out that actually I was just not well educated on that topic. Um, and uh, the more I, I, I read about it, and the better understanding I got it. I still think that, I still think that some... Uh, stuff is stupid, but uh, I understand why it's stupid now. That's the difference. Um, at the end, I brought some fun stories uh, to, to, to show a little bit what kind of issues I was confronted with. Um, so one software we have uh, uh, I've deployed was a VR software. Suddenly had parts of the 3D files tinted in red. So there was like particles flying around, and some of them suddenly were all red. And uh, nobody had an idea what it was and how it worked. Actually, if you set Windows from German to English, then the color goes back to normal. <laughs> <coughs> and I, I believe someone actually uh, uh, used some kind of path building to access the files and must have not used like a software library, but manually built the path to access it. And then probably uh, it tried to parse something in German and uh, then it failed and then the red color was missing. I have no idea. My expectation would have been that the software was patched, uh, but the result was that it was heavily documented that Windows must be set to English. And that, that, there we are in the, 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 the schematic I had before that actually you move at the step after the artwork where you try to find all the explanations why suddenly the language of Windows has an influence on your artwork. Uh, the other part is also quite important. Um, exhibition was suddenly offline. Nobody knew. All the remote access was, uh, was unavailable. The art talks were not working. 
Um, it was there easy? The cyber department, and this happened several times, just cut the uplink and didn't notify anyone because uh, they thought that some data was leaking because in the description it says that the data, the artwork receives data, but it uh, turns out that it actually sent data. Well, I mean, then you have to explain how TCP IP works. Uh, but they were like, no, this is not compliant. Or they were like, uh, what if the, the artwork hacks the internet? And I was like, that's just a Raspberry Pi that like, that runs some graphics. And they were like, no, that's a security threat. And you can contact this person, but the guy is on leave for many weeks. So actually nothing moves. Um, so d d I would have expected to discuss and get free internet. Uh, the solution was to use a mobile data stick and a SIM card. Um, and this is, uh, this is maybe, uh, I mean, these are more extreme. Uh, most of the venues I've been, it worked super fine. I got even my own SSID with the network for putting the artworks in. But it actually shows that you can build very complex artworks, um, and then you put it into a museum, and they have n little to no experience with complex media art. Um, and that's when we come to the maintenance part, is that often they will have a, a technician during the setup, because they don't, have not hired him, they got him as a freelancer. And uh, everything is set up, and then the guy leaves on the day of the opening. And a week later, the artwork breaks down, but there's no more technical staff at the museum, because why would it break? It's immutable, right? It's there, it doesn't change anymore. And then uh, they put a sign in front of it that says it's broken. If you are lucky, they will contact you and ask you to fix it, but some also just don't say anything and it stays broken for weeks. Um, which, I'm not blaming anyone, it's just a, a different understanding about how tech works um, and these kind of things. And the last story, I don't want to be tracked, I think that's my, the, the personal best one, um, is uh, there was an artwork that collects data from Wi-Fi uh, wi access active scanning. I don't know if all of you are aware of it, but your um, iPhone or whatever smartphone you use broadcasts the SSIDs it knows, so it doesn't have to look for all of them. It says, I know that I, I know the network 37C3, and then the access point replies, yes, I'm here, you can connect. If um, you're a hacker or artist, you can be like, oh yeah, I can actually extract the SSIDs that someone sends out and map them on a map, and then find out where this person was. You obviously do not store the Mac because you don't care about any kind of archive it is, but suddenly you have a device where you stand in front of it, and you open your phone, and on the screen, shortly afterwards, you see a map of all the locations you have visited. And it looks pretty scared. And actually, it's, it's nothing, I, I, I believe it's not illegal because it's all information that you have voluntarily shared. Um, and this was shown in a high security location frequented by lawyers. <laughs> and uh, then the discussion started. They were, this can't be legal. And uh, so you explain them, and they're like, no, but why do, how does it know where it went? And you explain even more, and you write reports, and then the solution is that at some point they get a brain meltdown, and they decide to put up a sign that you just shut off your Wi-Fi, and then the <laughs> problem is solved. But that, that, that comes back to what I said before, is the presentation is very important, because you start um, explaining, you have to explain tech, you have to explain how it works. Uh, if you use many, uh, some or many artworks already use um, AI or machine learning, computer vision to detect the age of the visitor standing in front of it. And then there's a lot of training that is done in, in Europe and you ship it to Asia and you forget to set the, the network to Asia and suddenly everyone has a weird age or, uh, I don't know, people with masks have beards. And this is, this is quite fun, but some visitors get uh, a bit upset when the computer says that they look 25 years older than they actually are. So, you, you, and they don't understand where this comes from, yeah? They think it's, it's the truth because the machine says it. So there's a lot of explanation that needs to be done. Um, and that, I think, often is um, underrated. Because if you want people to enjoy your work and not get angry at it, then you have to properly explain it. Um, I'll finish with an outlook. Um, more feedback looks are necessary. I think this is quite important. Um, Include the different teams, include all the persons who are involved in this process, artists, curators, conservators, restorators, and also um, visitors, because they're, uh, I don't want to say they're the testing part of your artwork, but um, they actually are part of it because they interact with it. And there has to be a better understanding for each other's professions between art and tech. 
Uh, I'm I'm a bit sick of hearing uh, artists be like, oh, all these nerds, they do fancy stuff, they're all magic. And on the other side, um, uh, technicians be like, oh, art is so stupid, I want to do anything, I want to have anything to do with it. Um, which is wrong, because both of them, as I said, uh, artists are hackers and hackers are artists. And um, that was my talk, thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much as well. Obelix, <laughs> in a truly artistic fashion, uh, he hacked my introduction to his talk. But we now have a time, 50 minutes to be precise, for questions. And I already see someone standing. Let's start with mic one, I believe. Hey. Hey? Yes, I hear you. Okay, good. <laughs> Um, what about using some of the qualities that digital artworks and software has when, when coming to conservation and restoration, rather than treating them like uh, normal artworks? So, for example, recently I rented an audiobook from my, <laughs> from my library, and they only have a certain amount of that audiobook, but in reality you can have infinite amount of audiobook or infinite amount of Picasso or Rembrandt or whatever. Uh, how do you feel about that? Can you repeat the first part again? Uh, what, how do you feel about treating artwork that is based on software more like software and less than like art? Well, um, the question was, I think I have to repeat it, um, was more about uh, why not uh, treat software-based artwork like software and therefore solve the problem? I think that was one of the main motivations of my talk, because actually I would want to do that. Um, and I believe that for many issues that artists or uh, entities in the art world have, there is a, a software if you, a solution if you just treat it as software. But for that you have to also acknowledge that it's not magic. Uh, because if you think it's magic and it's complicated and software is something that hackers do, then, then you get stuck with this kind of things. And um, it's kind of new and the development is very fast and I think difficult to grasp for someone who is not a hacker and is not used to this kind of fast-paced development. Because I think all of us are quite used to the fact that at some point software breaks down. But if you, let's say, you're an artist and you invest in technology and you, let's say you pay a lot of money or you do a lot of education on some special tech and two years later it goes out of service, then you'll be like, no, I want to, I want to keep that because you had a huge personal investment. And the more this understanding happens, the more you can actually do this kind of problem solving. So I, I think this is the way to go because um, if it's software, then you solve it like you solve software problems. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question on mic too, please. Yes, thank you for the talk. Um, so you mentioned the artwork by Peter Weiber where you used the Kinect sensor, right? I guess the sensor has been used for a lot of artworks around the globe. And I wonder if there are any institutions around the globe that somehow, you know, start to collect and store this kind of hardware which, you know, might be getting used in 20, 30 years or so. Because would you say that the internet is then the storage place or are there any institutions? and a uh, little comment, um, basically, or recently I just went, you know, to a lot of media art installations and I think st at the moment we're still facing the issue that even the people working in these museums doesn't or they don't know that these artworks are sometimes broken or not. And then you see a window screen and you tell them, hey, look, actually this piece is not working at all, you know. Yeah, um, to, to answer the question about how do you know if an art worker is broken or if it is just art? Um, that's not, yeah, uh, that, that's not so easy. If you, if, if you have like some, some fancy uh, a dithering and, and, and or we have seen artists work with JPEG compression, so it constantly looks broken. And, um, but th there are like some, some, some coping, uh, some solutions for that for, for artworks that I have um, co-produced. I usually uh, put a small pixel on the side of the screen that would blink. And so you could tell the staff, as long as this kind of stuff blinks, everything else works fine, even though it looks completely broken. Um, and about buying all the hardware, this is, um, this is what museums are actually already doing, but it's, it's a solution that only works for the midterm, right? Because even if you buy 100 Kinect, um, at some point you also have to buy 100 computers with USB 2 connectors, because, or you have to buy the adapter cables. Uh, suddenly also the framework goes out of service, because the moment the hardware is 
stop to be sold, also the development of all the related things completely stops. And uh, you can just buy 100 Connects, but then maybe they become unusable five years later because, I don't know, uh, it has to run Debian 6, but some other package has to run something else, and then you have to write, ask someone to adapt the driver, and then, you know, it, it becomes this kind of dependency hell. So it's only, it works for a short term and for a certain presentation, but um, there's no solution to that, so you just have to hope that it works as long enough, um, and then try to, to build with others. So the, I think the Kinect is a very interesting case because it works as a, it, um, as a depth sensor, so it has this depth sensor cam with the a time of flight sensor, and this is something that is maybe if someone has more information can say is built less and less because this kind of depth information can be extracted visually by computer vision now. So why would you build a complicated time of flight camera if you can just take a trained uh, uh, network and actually analyze the camera? But the, um, the artists are using different kind of data. They need this kind of raw data, so they. They, they, are, they are less about the actual function but, and more about the raw data. And that's where also you need to find a solution to make your artwork work if you don't have access to the raw data, independent of what kind of camera you buy, because the whole technology goes out of uh, production. Okay, thanks. Uh, again, Mike, one, <laughs> please. Hi, uh, thank you for that. A lot of that was incredibly relatable. Um, <laughs> and like, it's especially this part about the fact that like normal software development paradigms often kind of like break down in artistic creative contexts and that's often got me wondering and, and the people who do work in this space tend to be kind of hackers or people who just have learned exhaustively through experience um, and it's often made me wonder like what would a professionalization of creative coders or creative technologists look like and how could people better share information somehow or share knowledge um, well, one, one good way that I found is actually to have someone in-house working on it. Um, because if you are um, an institution or an entity or an artist, and each time you need tech advice, you rent it in terms of uh, hiring a freelancer, you, you just get help, but you don't get knowledge. And um, uh, the, the institutions that, 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 different that I visited, the ones who were pretty far advanced were those who had artists in residence, hackers in residence, who hosted hackathons, uh, other kind of hacking events, and were just were in part of the community, right? Because otherwise, if you're not part of it, you're just ordering stuff. And if you just order stuff, you can only buy stuff that's being sold, that's being, and, and so you, you, you have to be part of the ecosystem. And I don't know how it will look if you professionalize it, um, and, I mean, you could ask the same question about open source software development. I mean, it just runs because everyone is part of it. And the museum just has to also be part of it, or the artist. And then I think this solves nine out of ten problems. And then we can, then, then something else will come. But most of those just get solved by participation. There we okay, thank you. On mic two, the next question. Hi. Um, I'm too small. <laughs> um, so, um, let me think. Uh, first of all, you're very welcome in the Netherlands because I'm working in the cultural, inst in the cultural institution working on new media, so please come, uh, come with yes. us. Um, my question would be, like, when we work on um, digital bond collection and complex collection, um, I think you very much highlighted the fact that um, we have a, a shift from simple works to extremely complex digital works. And one of the issues that we are facing is obviously the proprietary software. And I wonder how do you address this in terms of preservation, because obviously when it's open source, then you can reopen it, and then you can preserve it better. But how, at this moment, we have so many people that are working on works which, on, which are based on proprietary software. We don't even know if the society are going to be, the, so the companies are going to be there in 30 years. So how do you approach this? Mm, I think it's important to educate also about the possibilities that such a commercial software offer because often they allow exporting in different formats. Let's say you can export it as a PDF or as VG or you can export raw files from it. So maybe you lose the ability of editing it the moment the software breaks down, but not necessarily you lose in terms of quality. Um, so. This is something you have to think, I think, from the beginning. Um, th th that is my personal strategy of, if I use a software that um, has a vendor lock-in, uh, that has to be bought, that has to be licensed, I try to be aware of what 
what does it mean for my, for, for my final artwork? Right? If I completely base it on some old software that is then out of service, then I'm not surprised anymore, and I can also communicate it to technicians. If someone would collect my artwork, I can go to the archive and say, by the way, there is an issue here, please have a look on it, maybe you have the idea. I think communicating this kind of things is quite important. Because as you say, the artworks get more and more complex, you have no idea what kind of module is there. Worst case, the artist has um, commissioned some software engineer to do it, who has asked his friend who did something, and you know, at the end you have a finished product, but you don't know where it came from. So this kind of understanding, where does it come from? Can I export it? Um, can I maybe use an alternative? So some maybe artists will say, oh, I always use the software, it's super fancy, and I'm totally used to it. And you can say, well, maybe do you want to use this alternative? You can get the same result, but for us it would be very helpful to take a look at this and maybe change your artwork for the sake of having easier conservation. I think this is the, the, the discussion that you need to have, and this is where the whole life cycle then goes back, that maybe an artist should also work in the conservation department so that they understand at some point mm -hmm. what it means to uh, cope with those challenges. Okay, thanks. Um, we only have five minutes left, so I would like to ask to keep your questions a bit shorter. <laughs> please, on mic two. One. Hey, uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I was wondering, so you're, you're on the one hand have like hackers and artists and um, I think I, from what I understood it's a lot about let's meet and I was, I, will, I wonder where should we meet? So um, how can I get in touch, how can I get involved? And this is coming from, I feel more like a visitor to both the hacker community as well as the art community. So. Um. Well, this can work through events. Um, this, the, 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 this depends a lot on the, on the institution and the way they function, because you have from, from art institutions and you have everything from private entities to governmental huge companies, and uh, you, this works very differently in, in all cases. But in my experience, the best way is through events, through common understanding, through artists going to hackerspaces, hackerspaces going to artistic spaces, um, meeting at, I would say, at the same eye level. So, uh, if, if you would have a hackerspace and a museum, I think the most important would be that you say the museum staff should go to the hackerspace and the other way around. So that you don't have this kind of sometimes weird situation where it feels like hackers are rendering some service for someone else who just consumes it. And I think the, the, the open source in the community is an ecosystem where you have e to equally contribute to get something out of it. But as an individual, it can be easier to contribute than if you are an uh, institution. And this, is, this needs a lot of education and saying also that contributing to a community from an institution can, can be, mean very small steps, doesn't have to be the big ones. Um, can be from hosting a, a round table, hosting a community meetup. Um, this is where it usually starts. So uh, start with the small things and then it will evolve. Thank you. Yeah, okay, we now, I, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, I will. yeah. okay, so Mike, too, please. Thank you. Um, there, were, there seems to be a, a big shift, uh, at least I assume, between, for, for a museum, between buying a painting and showing it and uh, hosting some work of complex digital art because it seems to be harder to estimate the cost of uh, keeping the, the artwork running, so to say. And I was wondering, um, that, did it ever happen that a museum or for an exhibition they decided not to show some uh, work because it was too expensive, the estimation for running it was too expensive or it was too complex? Or that happens all, all the time, ah, yeah, okay. uh, on a daily basis. Um, to give a good example about the maintenance part, I've seen artworks where you would have small robots running around and uh, but suddenly, and it was everything planned, it was set up, and uh, then the maintenance crew realized that actually they have to change the batteries every three hours for an exhibition that runs for nine months. <laughs> and there, there was, as far as I know, there was no discussion, it was immediately slashed, right? Um, and and it, it was sad because also this is something that you maybe don't realize if you build the artwork in, 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 your, in your artwork space, and you, for you it's fine to change the battery every two hours. For, um, for staff that needs to take care of hundreds of artworks, it's not. Mm. And um, I must, uh, I must uh, confess that I made that experience as artist, as self, myself, where I developed things, and I was like, that's no problem, like, I can just do it, it's like fine. 
and then actually I, I, I had to make the painful experience that um, that others don't think the same way that I do, and they believe that uh, having to do uh, two minutes of maintenance per day on my artwork is too much because for me it was fine. But they said, well, we have 100 artworks if we need to do two minutes of maintenance for each artwork. And this is the kind of thought process. Um, because maybe if you create an artwork as an artist, you don't think about all this. You have like an idea, it's like, yeah, I want to make a toaster that makes coffee, right? Mm. And then you put it in a museum and they'll be like, oh, that's not, that's a fire hazard. And suddenly your like, whole idea and emotion crumbles because like, it's slashed because of some weird regulation. So it's good to, to think about that. But yeah, that happens on a regular basis that things due to cost, uh, anything from due to energy consumption costs, they are slashed. Everything happens. There is no limit to that. Thank you, and um, beautiful t-shirt. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful t-shirt, speaking of. Yeah, I'm sorry we're running out of time for more questions, but I believe Obelix will be here, and we can uh, see who you are uh, based yeah. on the t-shirt. Again, sorry for cutting the introduction short. Uh, this is why we need to come up with another warm round of applause for Obelix. <laughs>